Due to Blazing Sword's respectable sales both in Japan and overseas, Nintendo continued to release future installments in the Fire Emblem series internationally, including one more title on the Game Boy Advance, 2005's The Sacred Stones. Unfortunately, for me, this is where things get sloppy. When I first played Sacred Stones, I was just a dumb teenager with zero capacity for analysis and no taste, but I could still tell that something was a bit off about the game compared with the previous title. The Sacred Stones isn't a bad game, but it is a step backward in most of the areas we've discussed so far. Either that, or it's not enough of a step forward. Artistically and mechanically, Sacred Stones is much the same as its predecessors, only this time the player character is gone. Instead, Sacred Stones experiments with a world map on which enemies randomly spawn, and trainee classes, which are recruited at a low level but provide a third promotion tier and thus more room for levels and stats. Speaking of promotion, each character now has two options to choose from when promoting, and we also see the reintroduction of skills for the first time since Thrasia 776, although they're not character specific this time but based on class. Unfortunately, I find that the negatives of these changes often outweigh the positives. The addition of a navigable world map is a rather odd change, as there's really very little depth to it. There was a world map in previous titles, and they act much the same as the one in Sacred Stones, except we now choose to walk to our next objective. However, many players criticize the random spawns on the map for making the game too easy, and while there is something to be said for that, my biggest problem with the world map isn't the random encounters, but the fact that after every chapter the player is free to buy new weapons and equipment primarily because this seems like something you shouldn't be able to do if you're supposed to believe the narrative, especially since the cutscenes draw attention to it, resulting in the first time I really exited the story. After reaching Fralia, Erika learns that Ephraim is fighting in Grotto and turns back to help him. She marches through the devastated Reneus, where towns like Lark are being completely wiped out, Grotto-held territory like Seraphiu, and Grotto itself, yet can purchase equipment in any of these areas. How are the shops in Reneus still able to do business? Surely those would be the first places bandits would loot, and why would the shops in Grotto sell to a wanted person? This bothers me less in the second half of the game, when at least Erika is traveling in more friendly territory, but the previous two games didn't have this issue. Most of the shops and Sword of Seals are on the west side of the map, areas that are generally friendly to the Lycian army, and by the time the player reaches Burn, he or she ought to have all the weapons they'll need. In Blazing Sword, it's not a full-scale war that's going on, the conflict is very much just between your group and Nergal's Black Fang, and there's no reason shops shouldn't or wouldn't be able to sell to your small group. Not only this, but these limited resources also create a sense of mechanical tension in those games that reflects the story. The hurried rally of Fere and Sword of Seals, and the small mobile search party in Blazing Sword. The army has only what the men can carry, and a very vulnerable transport unit. When weapons get low or break in those games, it's sometimes a real issue if you aren't keeping tabs on it. That extra level of management, and by extension tension, is gone in Sacred Stones, and it creates not only what many consider an easy game, but narrative dissonance as well. One way to mostly fix both my narrative concerns and the easy gameplay would simply be to remove the option to buy items on the overworld. If this were the case, the player would then have to choose whether they wanted to break some weapons and grind out levels, or save their weapons for the story maps. To take it one step further, an increased spawn for the creepy crawlies could go toward creating a real sense of tension and urgency, especially in the early game when reaching Ephraim is the main objective, as you would have to manage your weapons even more carefully than in Blazing Sword. As far as the trainee classes go, the problem is that there's really no reason not to use them, as they often turn out fantastic simply because of the additional levels they get. There is virtually no reason to use Garcia over Ross unless you're terribly interested in him, which we'll get to that later. For me, these trainee classes create a feeling of being steered or encouraged to use certain units over others. I generally try to use the characters I like in any given title. However, when I played Sacred Stones for the first time, I used Ross over Garcia, even though I didn't particularly like him because I recognized that he would have more levels and was therefore going to be an objectively better unit. But this isn't going to be the case for everybody, and you could even make the argument that all Fire Emblem games have had this problem of dictating which units to use because of unequal growth rates. But this is hidden information, and unless you go looking for it, you could play the entire series none the wiser, and at least on normal mode, every character is more or less viable. Sacred Stones brings this formerly hidden information front and center with characters who are vastly superior to others, and have overwhelmingly good stats. 
you really can't turn down Ross's 13 points of strength at level 1 unless you're specifically trying to make the game more difficult for yourself. The second option for promoted units is also a bit puzzling. There are almost enough units in the game so that each class is represented. If you promote characters to only the classes you don't have, and those who won't come pre-promoted, the only classes you can potentially miss are Mage Knight, Bishop or Valkyrie, Druid or Summoner, and one of the Wevern classes. That said, there was never a really difficult choice when it came to promotion, or a situation in which I desperately needed a particular type of unit. Not to mention that with the random spawns and the Tower of Volney to level up all of the characters for no real cost, there are enough maps so that all the characters and classes will see some use. You could say that the option is an attempt to add more variety to the game, but most of the new classes don't really add anything new. The Great Knight, for example, is little more than a mounted general. They serve the same basic function. High defense, high strength, versatile weapons, but now they're mounted. Mage Knight is the same basic idea, mounted sage. There's nothing significant added, nothing that really changes the way the player can use the unit on a tactical level. At least not enough that I really feel the option is justified. Take Shadow Dragon's Ballistician for comparison. They have low movement, high defense, average damage, and massive range. But because they're so versatile, they open up avenues for new strategies. You can bait enemy units into attacking a high defense unit while you attack safely from range. If a cleric somewhere in the middle of the map is giving you grief, you can quickly pick him off. And of course, they're a hard counter to flying units. Ballisticians offer the player a multitude of options by just being present on the map. Options that the player doesn't really get with the Mage Knight or Great Knight. The Summoner class is more like it, as it's a completely new class with a unique skill that allows it to summon phantom units onto the map. And when I first played the game, I chose Summoner without a second thought. However, I quickly realized that these phantoms are rather limited in their tactical application, as they can really only be used in one way, to bait enemy units. And by the time Summoners are available, you surely have other, more reliable units capable of luring enemies. About the only one of these new classes worth using for more than a map or two is the Weverin Knight, and not because it adds a new element to battles or because it unlocks the potential for new strategies, but because it gets a really great skill. Speaking of skills, while it's indicated that the character will gain a skill upon promotion, for some there's no description of the skill, despite it being the first time players outside of Japan have seen them, which seems like an oversight that could have easily been fixed. And that wraps up Sacred Stones mechanically. There's a lot to talk about, but not much that really improves the game in any significant way. At best it's iterative, and at worst it's superficial. And on that rather bleak note, we move on to the characters. The writing in the Sacred Stones is some of the laziest thus far in the series, which is a surprise since the stuff in Blazing Sword was pretty good. It shares Sword of Seal's problem where the supports feel distant from the overarching conflict, but to an even greater extent in Sacred Stones. And also, many of the characters, despite having the potential to be interesting, become rather one-dimensional over the course of the game. Motivation isn't really an issue this time, as it's a full-scale war. The characters don't fight because they want to, but because they have no other choice. And the introductions to the characters leave plenty of room for interesting supports. Colm resorts to thievery to provide for himself and Naomi after the destruction of his town. Garcia's home is destroyed, and with nowhere else to go, joins Erica's army. And Ross takes advantage of the opportunity to prove to his father that he's no longer a child. Unfortunately, when the introductions to the characters have so much potential, and with motivation covered in pretty much the same breath, the problems with the writing become even more apparent. Characters tend to have a thing that dominates many of their conversations. Ford, for example, talks about painting in four of his five supports. Naomi discusses her legendary granddad in three of five, and there's little variety throughout any of these. In addition, many characters have little quirks that they never really move beyond. Naomi cries a lot. La Rochelle is bombastic. Even in their A-level conversations, this tick is dredged back up as if the player had somehow forgotten about it. In the worst case scenarios, we're simply told a character is something. Garcia is some incredible warrior. Loot is a prodigy. But we never see this in their supports or in gameplay. The biggest problem though is that, with the exception of maybe Tana, outside of the war the characters have no real struggles or flaws to overcome, and it becomes more like a poorly written fan fiction than anything else as we watch a host of perfect characters save the world. As a result, there's very little development in the truest sense of the word. 
The characters don't change, mature, or grow in any of these conversations. There are no arcs to see. It's not that there's not room for development. What was Colm like before the war, and how does he feel about now being a thief? Does he ever think about what Seth said to him? How does Naomi feel about the whole situation? To see her childhood friend and possibly lover reduced to a common thief? Does she feel responsible in some way? What exactly has Ross learned about what it means to be a man from fighting a war? There are certainly avenues for interesting discussion and real issues, but instead we focus on things like the outcome of an arm wrestling contest between Garcia and Gilliam, or Lute's manner of helping Arthur. I'm learning things about the character, sure, but I don't feel like any of it is really important or has any relevance to the overarching story and how the characters feel about the war they've been dragged into. Even Erica, who is ostensibly our main character, doesn't change at all by the end of the story. She begins her story wanting peace and to help her brother, and takes up a sword to make it happen, but it's difficult to say whether the war had any real effect on her. For contrast, look at Lynn. By the end of Lynn's short story, we see that the knowledge that she's royalty has had an effect on her. We see her looking out towards Sake, uncertain about what she wants to do. And at the end of the game, we see her make a choice. A choice that changes depending on how the player plays the game. Does she return to Sake with Wrath? Does she take the title of Marquise? What's important is that she changes as a result of her experience and the people she forms relationships with. There's nothing like that for Erica. She's pretty much the same person we started this story with regardless of how you play the game. There were parts where I was expecting a change for Erica, like for example this line. I thought she was getting into the fighting and would perhaps better understand Ephraim when he tells her of his desire to fight. But that's not the case. It seems awfully aggressive for the recognition that fighting is sometimes necessary to protect the things you care about. Neither does it fit a person resigned to violence, as she should be at this point. Not to mention that she says it to someone she's met before, who describes her as kind and merciful. And that's pretty rude. Nothing ever really comes of the line either, and I find it to be one of the most jarring in the entire game, as the sudden bravado doesn't fit the established character at all. To even further illustrate the quality of the writing, let's revisit genealogy for a moment and compare Levin and Joshua, two characters who, on the surface, are quite similar. Both are princes who left home one day to see life outside the palace, and both have a noble goal of better understanding the people of their nations. This should already set off alarm bells, but nevertheless. As noble goals won't fill a stomach, however, both need a job. Levin becomes a bard, Joshua a mercenary. And this is where things get confusing. Mercenaries, especially those in the Fire Emblem series, hold no loyalties except to those who pay them. They rarely identify as citizens of any particular nation and are either managed by a guild or live together in very insular communities. They are treated with very little respect, often seen as a necessary evil even by those who employ them. Proper soldiers often don't trust them or are outright rude to them. Sometimes they're even afraid of them. All of this is to say that I'm unsure of what exactly Joshua planned to learn about the people of his nation working with a group of mercenaries. To be fair, I don't know whether he took the job out of choice or necessity, but it seems an awfully poor fit for a prince looking to better understand his people. Bards, on the other hand, don't have much of a history in Fire Emblem, at least not until the Game Boy Advance era. In fact, Levin was the first one in the series. However, historically they were much like our street musicians of today except that they were often quite popular figures, both in their time in the palaces and later on in the cities, as they were certainly entertaining to be around if you, like most of the population, couldn't read. Later medieval bards couldn't pick and choose who would make up their audience and would perform from anyone from noble to pauper, and if we can assume that this is the case in the Fire Emblem universe as well, then it's a good fit for Levin as a prince, because it's his job to make people happy, and if he's a good bard, he may well be a good king too. That's not to say that he'll be great at things like foreign policy and trade agreements, but the people will like him, and there is something to be said for that. So what kind of person is Levin? Well, it's worth noting that his first question is a rhetorical one, about what the army could possibly be doing when bandits are torching the villages, and after hearing the whole story he offers to go sort it out himself, with a little recompense of course. The following scene with Sylvia, however, gives the impression that it's not the first time he's pulled this stunt with a woman indicating that he's a bit of a philanderer, and perhaps not quite as noble as he may have initially appeared. Levin's personality takes on another facet in his recruitment chat, in which he's highly critical of Sigurd. But upon learning that he doesn't really want to be there himself, Levin joins up with Sigurd, 
and the chat ends with the last bit of mystery. Joshua's introduction establishes him as a confident Lothario type with a bit of a roguish streak. He's all about luck, mentioning it a total of five times in his introductory chapter, and if we couldn't infer from his earlier foray in the arena, in his recruitment chat with Natasha he comes right out and says that he lives for gambling. He doesn't care about Natasha's reasons for betraying Grotto or what may or may not have happened to the king, but proposes his bet simply because she's beautiful. He's kind of a scumbag, and this is all we learn about him until the end of chapter 14, which is why Joshua's reveal in that chapter is so sudden, and not in a good way, because there was no indication that he was anyone other than who he appeared to be. His explanation doesn't make any sense either, because it doesn't match up with his established character. He was ready to kill a holy woman for a paycheck. Is this how a prince who wants to better understand the people acts? Levin's reveal works because there was intrigue. From the moment Sigurd meets him, they both know there's something not being said. That something becomes important later in the game when we see his strained relationship with his mother and learn that Levin left home because of pressure regarding the succession of his nation after the death of his father. And with multiple parties vying for control, he simply removed himself from the equation. Is it selfish? Perhaps. His mother certainly seems to think so. But there's another angle to that as well. The character we spent the last several hours getting to know the cavalier, cocksure, mildly smug bard, certainly wouldn't know anything about the people he would be responsible for as king. Thus his leaving makes sense not only for personal reasons, but from a future developmental angle as well. Not only this, but his insight in that first conversation with Sigurd indicates that, despite his less noble characteristics, he is making progress in his goal to better understand the people. While Levin's development is woven throughout Genealogy's narrative, Joshua's involvement with the overarching story is limited to his introduction in Chapter 5, his reveal in Chapter 14, and some part later on where they all swear to help or whatever. This means that any real development is found in his supports. So, what do we learn about Joshua and his support with Marissa? Well, nothing we didn't already know really, but that's fine. How about the one with Inez? Well, surely there's something there with Natasha. The fact that these two are both main characters in their respective stories makes genealogy look like literature in comparison. On the story front, the Sacred Stones treads much of the same narrative ground that Sword of Seals did. Your country is invaded by a mysterious villain with an unknown motivation. You have to rally the troops and fight back. Sound familiar? The differences are in the details, of course, and with a couple of fairly well-done twists along the way, we eventually find out that the twins' friend Leon is the antagonist this time. To be fair, he can be a sympathetic villain. Leon's a nice guy who just wants to help people, and to do so experiments with the magic of the sacred stone that he doesn't fully understand, and his weakness allows the demon that was sealed inside the stone to possess his body. I like that the main characters have a relationship with him, so their victory should come at some personal cost to them. But at the end, neither one seems too terribly bothered by his death. Even the very last scene seems more for the player than either of the characters who were apparently his friends. This may be a product of the dialogue being so stiff, formal, and wordy that there's very little room for real emotion in the story, even at the most trying of times. It's hard to say that Ellawood in Blazing Sword is any better, but at least he has scenes in which he's genuinely distressed. And Hector and Lynn laugh, argue, and act like people whereas characters in the Sacred Stones act like robots. Personally, however, since the game consists entirely of cleaning up Leon's mess, I didn't feel nearly as much sympathy for him as I did for Nergal. The other three lesser antagonists are bad to the bone, with little justification for their badness. Not to mention that they even look laughably evil now, which isn't exactly compelling stuff. A positive for Sacred Stones, however, is the branching paths, as there's considerably more to it than Blazing Sword's almost insultingly similar campaigns. After meeting up in Chapter 8, Erika and Ephraim part ways again for six unique maps each. After that, the two meet up and play the remaining seven together. It's a small but significant change that rewards multiple playthroughs much more than Blazing Sword did, not to mention that there are special rewards for beating the game with each of the twins. However, the game is also shorter than the previous title, sporting only 21 chapters, 10 fewer than Blazing Sword and it moves at an absolutely blistering pace, with no side quests, bonus objectives, or potential diversions, despite the player having more freedom on the map than ever before. 
and while I appreciate that 4 matches content as far as the war is concerned, it feels more accidental than intentional. One of my biggest annoyances with the Sacred Stones is just how repetitive it is. This is a problem in the support conversations as the characters repeat their little quirks, but it's also the case in the cutscenes and the introductions to the chapters, both of which sometimes repeat the exact same information. I could understand this if the save system worked slightly differently, and allowed the player to quit either before or after the overworld intro, which would then have the cutscene serve as a sort of refresher, but it doesn't, leaving one completely or mostly unnecessary. Occasionally they work well, like this one for Darkling Woods, but even the beginning of this one could be cut, because it's information the player is already well aware of if he's been paying any attention to this rather climactic part of the game. The same basic structure is present in earlier titles too, but the two voices rarely cross into each other's territory. The overworld intro is spoken by an omniscient narrator who deals with the big picture. The army has completed Objective A, and is now moving to Location X where they'll face off against enemy Y, and occasionally fills in the player on the history, way of life, economy, or geography of the area. Whereas the cutscene intro focuses more on the characters on the ground level, how they're responding to the current situation, and of course, tactics. This excessive repetition makes the story feel padded, like they couldn't come up with anything else, and so just slightly reword things they've already said, which is particularly annoying when most of what's already there makes me want to run through the script with a red pen. The fun doesn't stop there, though. The last point of confusion is one that Ephraim himself brings up at the close of the game. He and his crew were able to defeat the Demon King for good by using just one stone, whereas the heroes before had all five and were only able to seal him away. How? What did Erica and Ephraim do that the heroes didn't? What changed between the generations? And how is La Rochelle so certain that it will work? This is the only time since the hero sealed it that this has happened, right? This would be a perfect place to inject some of that non-existent friendship between Leon and the twins into the mix, and write a story that incorporates some themes. And although working with what they have, it might end up trite, it's better than not acknowledging it at all as it stands now. More than anything, the Sacred Stones feels perfunctory, like it's just going through the motions. It does little to push the series forward in any meaningful way, and the fact that the whole game has the depth of a puddle really soured me on the whole Fire Emblem experience. I'd been there, I'd done that, and it was better the first time. It's not awful, but it is one of the weakest titles in the series. It's likely that flagging sales convinced the team to focus on making the game more accessible, and certainly one way to do that is to make it less challenging, which is what the Sacred Stones did, in every sense of the word. You have three pretty much RNG-proof characters, multiple ways to grind out levels, a shorter, streamlined narrative with no bells or whistles, no discernible themes, forgettable characters with no real identities outside of singular traits, and little variety regardless of where you look, whether it be the supports, the maps, the classes, the enemies, you name it. It is uninspired, but there's always next time, right? Speaking of next time, we'll be taking a look at Fire Emblem Awakening. I'll see you then.